1943, America launches a bold new strategy that promises victory, but delivers the unexpected. Now, there was no battle before, no battle since, like Tarawa. Ferocious conflicts will shape the course of the war, sparking new innovations and breaking new barriers. With color combat footage and rare film from behind the lines, hear the voices and feel the fight. It looked like you're headed for hell, because you were. November 1943, a full-scale invasion force cuts through the open sea. 100 ships, 35,000 men. They're the tip of the spear in America's first large-scale amphibious assault of the Pacific War. Confidence rides high. The size of the fleet dwarfs the target, Tarawa, a whisper-thin atoll with an airfield tucked in the corner. This island is half the size of New York's Central Park. The commanding officers lay out their prize. The air base is one of Japan's most important, and the Americans must secure it to advance in the Pacific. All have been trained, but few have been tested. Marine combat cameraman Norm Hatch is among them. He's carrying three cameras and 5,000 feet of film. He's confident about the battle. We packed shovels along with us, but we figured we didn't have to dig any foxholes, only Jap graves. Hatch films the long days leading up to the invasion. Marines assemble ammunition, test fire weapons into the sea. Exercise relieves the tension. On the eve of the invasion, Father Frank Kelly helps calm the nerves. He's a familiar face to those who fought on Guadalcanal. But for the rest, it's their first taste of war. It will be an unforgettable baptism. Before dawn, the Marines pour into the landing craft. As daylight breaks, the ships open fire above their heads to soften defenses. They pound the tiny island for four solid hours. Johnny Singleton recalls the destruction. We thought after all our planes bombarding and attacking, there would be nothing left on the island. Then, Navy planes take over. In all, Americans rip into Tarawa with over four million tons of steel. The Navy promised that they would have all the Japs killed by the time we got there. So we really weren't all that worried. The plan is to land the Marines on the island's northern beaches and move towards the key target, the airstrip at the center. Sheltered in the landing craft, the men are confident. They're using amphibious tractors called Amtraks for the first time. Americans hope they can plow through the Japanese defenses. As troops approach, the Navy ships silence their guns. The island looks lifeless. Silence. 
Suddenly, incoming fire grazes the invaders. Marines feel relatively safe huddled in their boats. But the pounding intensifies. Then, unexpectedly, the boats grind to a halt. They anticipated the tide was going to be in. It didn't turn out that way. The boats ran into a reef about 500 yards out. The Japs began to get in our range, in the range of the Amtraks. The water was real low. We were just sitting out there being slaughtered. Naval planners misjudged the tide. They expect five feet of water over the reef, but there's only three. The Amtraks are stranded. Machine gun fire intensifies and mortars rain down. The men are sitting ducks. They have one choice, abandon ship or be blown out of the water. Norm Hatch is watching the invasion unravel right in front of him. Everybody had to go over with 80 pounds of gear and drop in the water. The Marines are forced to wade 700 yards under Japanese mortar and machine gun fire. They are being mowed down in rows. We could see the machine gun bullets hitting the water like raindrops. We'd see a man disappear. Then another man would disappear. Hatch carries his hand-cranked 35-millimeter camera and wades in right beside machine gunners. They fight their way onto the crowded beach. Men are pinned down in waves. We ran into a hornet's nest. It was brutal, up front and personal, eyeball to eyeball. Some units have already lost half of their men. What began as a smooth operation is quickly going awry. Japanese footage reveals the unnerving truth. Harawa is a heavily defended killing field with 5,000 soldiers ready to fight. Hundreds of pillboxes, gun nests, minefields, and bunkers dot the island, all surrounded by a huge seawall made of coral and coconut logs. The Marines that have finally made it onto the beach are now trapped against the massive wall. The Amtraks were supposed to help the Marines breach these defenses. But many remain stuck on the reef hundreds of yards offshore. Those that make the beach are often too shot up to work. The few that do work are unable to clear the wall. We were using old alligator tractors. The first ones built, they were like a big tin can. My tractor reared up on the seawall and most men fell out. The Navy opens fire again, hoping to cover the incoming troops. But things are going from bad to worse. Marines can no longer coordinate attacks. A lot of things went wrong. The radios got salt water in them, so we didn't have communications. Just a few hours into the invasion, hundreds of bodies cover the beach. Tanks can't even get around them. Americans thought they were prepared for Tarawa. How did it come to this? Before Tarawa, the Allies had begun to roll back the Japanese in the Pacific. In June and July 1943, Americans invade the remote Aleutian Islands near Alaska. In a few short weeks, they reclaim these barren cold lands from Japan and regain control of the North Pacific. 
In the far-flung islands of the Southwest Pacific, General MacArthur is inching forward, targeting strongholds through New Guinea, New Britain, and the Solomons. From here, MacArthur envisions a path to liberate the Philippines and eventually invade Japan itself. But Admiral Nimitz proposes another route to Japan, far bolder and demanding an entirely new form of warfare, island hopping. Northeast of MacArthur's theater, starting with Tarawa in the Gilberts, tiny islands become stepping stones to leapfrog through the open waters of the Central Pacific to Japan. Led by Nimitz, the troops set off for Tarawa, confident they have enough men and machines to easily overrun the tiny atoll. But what should have been a cakewalk is turning into the bloodiest American landing of the Pacific War. While troops on Tarawa experience hell on Earth, a smaller unit is sent to invade the neighboring island of Macon. Lucky for them, it's a different world. The Americans outnumber the defenders two to one, and the Japanese have few heavy weapons. They quickly secure a large chunk of the island, meeting occasional pockets of resistance. But back on Tarawa, it's a different story. For those who have survived this far, luck may be running out. They can't move. They are pinned down by enemy fire, and the reinforcements are having trouble making it to the landing zones. During the night, the Japanese have swum out to wrecked amphibians and set up machine guns. Now, Americans turn their guns back out to sea to pick off their own hijacked landing craft. On the beach, the Japanese continue to hurl massive firepower from dug-in defenses. The Japanese were mostly underground all the time. Then you'd go by, and they'd come out and fire at you as you were passing by. You can't imagine it. It was unrealistic. So far, 1,500 Americans are dead, missing, or wounded. The medics were overwhelmed. There were so many guys that were in such bad shape that you know, many of them were marked dead and they were still alive. Fresh Marine reinforcements finally began to arrive. They have a tiny toehold on the island and command pockets of the northern beaches. As the day winds on, they link up scattered Marine units take the airfield in the center of the island and try to push across Tarawa. The Marines call in Sherman tanks to help, the first to see action in the Pacific. But visibility from inside is poor. The relatively light 37 millimeter guns are powerless against the strong Japanese fortifications and tank radios have different frequencies than infantry radios. The Shermans are worthless. Of the 14 used in the battle, only two survive. By the end of D plus one, Marines have split the island's defenses in half. They've crossed the airstrip and occupy abandoned defensive works on the south side. We just charged right across the island, uh, shooting anything trying to blow up every bunker that we went by. But capturing Tarawa will take a lot more than just running over it. This wasn't going to be any 24-hour operation. There were plenty of Japs on the island, and they had decided to die there.
The Marines still face an awesome task. They must advance east across the island, removing each pillbox and foxhole along the way. It's a dirty and dangerous job. Marines use hand grenades and fire to blast out the enemy. They would use flamethrowers and shoot them in through the openings into the bunker. The flames really didn't burn people up. Guys would either suffocate or run out because you had sucked up all the oxygen. The battles are ferocious and intense. Rarely do Americans see their enemy, but Norm Hatch captures one epic moment. I heard one of the Marines yell, here come the Japs, so I just swiveled my body. That's the only time, to the best of my knowledge, in the Pacific War that the enemy is in the same frame as us. As D plus two grinds on, the Marines mop up remaining Japanese positions one by one. The island looks blown to bits. It's like advancing through a wasteland. Snipers are everywhere. They tie themselves in the trees and take pot shots at the Americans. The battle for Tarawa is now a war of extermination. The men on land are not the only victims. A Japanese submarine scores a direct hit on the USS Liscombe Bay. She sinks in 23 minutes and loses 687 of her men. Truman Gill sees the tragedy from the USS Mississippi. I jumped up and saw an aircraft carrier that had been hit by a big torpedo. All the ammunition exploded. The men were instantly killed. This strike will count as more than 30% of the total loss of American life during the battle. A few hours later, Allied ships and planes unload another massive barrage onto the island. It appears to pay off. Only a few pockets of resistance remain. But those pockets are fierce. Here, Marines use a flamethrower against a stubborn enemy stronghold. Norm Hatch keeps his camera rolling. There wasn't any end, you just walked away. There wasn't anybody left to fight. After three days of fighting, Americans finally declare the island secure. The Japanese have fought to the last man. Of their 5,000 soldiers, only 17 survive. Americans take few prisoners. Most are Korean laborers. To guard against concealed weapons, they cut away their clothes. Japan once boasted it would take a million men a hundred years to take Tarawa. America proved otherwise, but at a shocking cost. President Roosevelt grants permission to release images of the battle to the public. HR is getting close. 
three days before we moved in, over four million pounds of explosives had been dropped on the island. It didn't seem possible that anyone could live through that bombardment. The film shows Americans the true ravages of the war, uncensored. These are Marine dead. The nation is shocked. A tropical island has become a putrid graveyard. Thousands of bodies lie decaying in the scorching heat. It takes three days of hard fighting, over 1,000 dead and 2,000 wounded, to capture an island of less than three square miles. This is the price we have to pay you for a war we didn't want. And before it's over, there'll be more dead on other battlefields. The film wins an Oscar. Tarawa leaves the public shaken and the military under fire. The newly secured airfields prove highly valuable but the cost was too great. Island hopping has failed its first big test. For war planners, it's back to the drawing board. They redesigned the plan from top to bottom. Troops train under live fire learn how to use upgraded weapons, and experiment with new landing craft. The failures of Tarawa also spark a new concept, underwater demolition teams, a precursor to the U.S. Navy SEALs. 180 men joined the first training program. They practice underwater reconnaissance and demolition to clear the path for future assaults. Other ideas push America to think big. The new Essex-class carrier joins the force. It is faster, larger, and carries almost 100 fighter planes, enough to support a distant island invasion. Equipped with better radar, it can detect enemy planes farther away, giving it more confidence in the wide open seas. Finally, it could go deeper in enemy territory than any other carrier had been since the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor. Another type of carrier, the Independence class, also enters the scene. It's actually a converted cruiser, smaller but faster than the Essex. They operate in groups to concentrate firepower. Nimitz and the Allies are hoping these new flat tops will be the key to island hopping success. Both the Essex and Independence carriers will launch a new airplane, the F-6F Hellcat. They are specially modified to deal with their prime adversary, the Japanese Zero. It's 30 miles per hour faster, with better armor and more firepower. But improvements don't stop here. After their testy start at Tarawa, Americans completely overhaul the Amtraks. Sporting a new design, they're faster, more protected, and deadlier. Some have howitzer rockets to blast Japanese fortifications. They'll be stronger, but harder to drive. They started putting armor plating on our tractors. They would just cut a little slot for you to look out. You couldn't see much, only straight ahead of you. Sherman tanks, another Tarawa flop, also get an overhaul. 
They have better radios and a telephone on the outside so infantry can talk to the crew inside. They have more armor and bigger guns. And some have a totally new weapon. Fire. Americans wonder if flamethrowers can destroy what traditional firepower could not. With this new machinery, the U.S. hopes to finally flex its muscle over the Pacific. But it's all in the hands of boys. Guys barely out of high school trained for a life they never expected. Doug Aitken recalls the rough waters off California. We went for a few weeks up and down the coast for training. I think it was better known as get ready or seasickness, guys. I was sick as a dog, wondering why in the world did I ever join the Navy? Each landing team learns the ropes, net climbing, and disembarking. They receive a week of amphibious training and rehearse with simulated naval gunfire and air support. We did some training with Amtraks. That was a scary thing. Here you are, going off the end of an LST ramp, and the nose diving down into the water. You're wondering how much water can we take on before we'd start sinking. The troops practice hand-to-hand -hand combat, jungle attacks, and fire their weapons, all with live ammunition. You'd be surprised the people in there that got hurt in basic training. They didn't give a damn. Hell, we're at war. Shape up. That's how they put us in shape. After a final briefing, they load up for a 2,000-mile trip across the Pacific. For most, it's the farthest they've ever been from home, on the way to their first war. The commander inherited a bunch of green, untested, untried, untrained people like me into operating a ship. I was just a kid when I went in. I had never been any place, hadn't done anything. It was easy for us country boys, because we were used to hard work. Some of the city boys, you'd hear them crying in their bunks. It's a 10-day voyage. Soldiers pass the time getting briefed on their targets, getting to know each other, and preparing for a time-tested ritual of naval bonding, hazing. When a ship crosses the equator, new troops endure the Neptune ceremony. This transforms a new recruit into a trusty sailor. In Navy slang, a polywog becomes a shellback. Naval officer John Herchak, dressed as a chaplain, is on board the USS Knox and films the folly with his own camera. There is often a beauty contest, and each department must present at least one contestant in swimsuit drag. Presiding over the ceremony is King Neptune, ruler of the high seas. They shave you. They make you go up to King Neptune, and he's got this great big dome, and you have to kiss it. They cut your hair and paint it yellow. Damn, the things those guys did to us, it was unbelievable. We were black and blue, and I was sure glad when that day was over with. For now, it's all fun and games, despite the painful hazing. But as they steam directly into war, real pain is just beyond the horizon. In the shadow of the pyramids near Cairo, Egypt, in the heart of the Muslim world, the leaders of China, Great Britain, and the United States meet face to face for the first time. At the Cairo conference in November of 1943, 
the three heads of state agree to the overall plan for the defeat of Japan. America will maintain a two-pronged approach across the Pacific. MacArthur will advance from New Guinea, isolating Japanese strongholds in the south. Nimitz will keep island hopping up the central Pacific. After the capture of Tarawa and the Gilberts, the next step is the low-lying Marshall Islands. The first stop, Kwajalein. America steams west with new tools and a new strategy. The key commanders who fought on Tarawa have absorbed their lessons well. They now know amphibious warfare requires more of everything. More shelling, more landing craft, and more air support. In late November, airplanes launched from Tarawa begin to zero in on the marshals. American bombers drop more than 111 tons of explosives. Here, a fighter locks onto a prime target, a Japanese airfield. The onslaught continues for two months, knocking virtually every Japanese plane out of commission. But Japanese film reveals the hidden truth. 28,000 ground troops await the Americans, 23,000 more than Tarawa. Long and crescent-shaped, Kwajalein is the largest coral atoll in the world. The targets are the main island of Kwajalein at the southern tip, and the island of Roy Namur the next day. Since they're 40 miles apart, the assault requires two separate campaigns. The plan, hit Kwajalein on day one, then attack Roy Namur the next day. As they approach Kwajalein on February 1st, the enemy is nowhere in sight. The bomb damage is surreal. I have never seen such a shambles in my life. The beach was a mass of highly colored fish that had been thrown up there by nearby explosions. One soldier confesses the entire island looked as if it had been picked up 20,000 feet and then dropped. As Americans sneak up to Kwajalein, there's barely a whimper of crossfire. The Japanese are defending the ocean side, believing the reef side is too shallow for landing craft. But the new Amtraks make it possible. The Japanese are caught defending the wrong beach. The landings go off with the precision of a drill. They clear the island in four days. On Roy Namur, Japanese are also overwhelmed. Of 3,500 defenders, only 51 survive. The islands are secured in a day. America sweeps aside the embarrassment of Tarawa with a glowing victory. Heavy machinery will pave America's new stepping stone in the Pacific. The men celebrate their triumph. dip in the surf helps clean off the Kwajalein dirt. Admiral Nimitz himself comes to inspect the island in person and congratulate the troops on their success. But they might be even more impressed by who comes next.
Now that the island is secure, America deems it safe for nurses. Women in the Pacific aren't allowed anywhere near combat areas. Little more than a year ago, 77 nurses were taken prisoner in the Philippines. So on Kwajalein, nurses are under a tight watch. Fenced in quarters, strict curfews, and armed escorts. Conditions were very primitive. There were 24 nurses and millions of mosquitoes, all living in one tent. We worked seven to seven, and we rotated for night duty. We didn't get a day off. They work hard and make the most of whatever downtime they have in their temporary tropical home. So far, 60,000 nurses serve far and wide on America's war fronts. But women are doing more than nursing. Every service branch is making room for new roles. Some jobs are familiar, but others are brand new. By now, close to half a million women are working in factories. They're building bombs, weapons, and aircraft. The Willow Run Ford factory outside Detroit saw few women before the war. Now, thousands of them are building the B-24 bomber. They pick up where the men left off and stay on pace to build one bomber an hour. They operate cranes, assemble parts, and install wiring. Women prove they can build airplanes from scratch. But who will deliver them to the Army? When a shortage of pilots hits the Army Air Force in 1943, the WASPs are born. Women Air Force Service Pilots. Led by top aviator Jackie Cochran, WASPs are trained at Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas, making it the first co-ed military flying field in U.S. history. We went through the same training as the men did, ground school in the morning and flying in the afternoon, primary, basic, advanced, night flying and instrument flying. But wartime films reveal they can't quite escape the old stereotypes. Though each girl is a pilot when she comes, she must adjust herself to a new technique, and hairdos are sacrificed. Time out for the daily sun bath, storing up energy against the grueling training of minds and bodies for the tremendous responsibilities that lie ahead. Six American beauties, 12 for well, there's a pilot and co-pilot in each. The news spreads fast, and the rumors start flying. During the first week at Sweetwater, more than 100 male pilots make unnecessary forced landings just to have a look at the young women. Soon the place is barred from all outsiders and becomes known as Cochrane's Convent. Nearly 1,100 women earned their wings, the first women to fly American military aircraft. They take test flights, ferry planes from factories to air bases, and fly simulated strafing missions. Women log more than 60 million miles flying every type of airplane. Many will end up in the skies over the Pacific. I flew 43 different types of aircraft. There were a lot of men who didn't think women could fly military planes, but we showed them. World War II is everybody's war. But only a few have the power to decide where the war will go next.
for Admiral Nimitz, it's been a steep learning curve. Tarawa was a debacle, but the lessons applied at Kwajalein were a stunning success. Now Nimitz wants to press on with his island hopping campaign, but General MacArthur still isn't convinced. Island hopping with extravagant losses and slow progress is not my idea of how to end the war as soon and as cheaply as possible. Instead, MacArthur wants to keep the pressure on in the South Pacific. Dubbed Operation Cartwheel, his plan is to gain footing on the New Guinea coast, move up the ladder of the Solomons to Bougainville, and isolate Rabaul, the strongest Japanese base in the area. Japanese footage reveals Rabaul's awesome defenses. Known as the Pearl Harbor of the South Pacific, it houses five airfields, hundreds of anti-aircraft guns, and more than 100,000 troops. Here, the Japanese have built a mighty fortress, and they won't back down easily. But American planes buzz overhead undeterred. The Japanese brace themselves. By the winter of 1943, MacArthur has his sights set on the large island of Bougainville in the Northern Solomons. From there, he can easily strike Rabaul and silence Japan's air power in the region. A force of 14,000 sets out to attack Bougainville on November 1st. The Japanese call in their heavy cruisers and destroyers from Rabaul. The U.S. Navy is shorthanded. Many ships are tied up with island hopping in the Central Pacific. In a desperate move, they put the new generation of Essex and Independence carriers to the test. Bombers join the mission. They eliminate their targets one by one. Damaging ships and two thirds of the Japanese planes. America's first big attack from a carrier succeeds in crippling Japan's air power. Bougainville finally falls into allied hands. But Americans won't stop until they neutralize Rabaul. The raids and the strafing missions continue. Many of these are staged from a handful of small air bases carved out of the mountainous New Guinea jungle. This one belongs to the 345th Bombardment Group otherwise known as the Air Apaches. These are Captain John Hanna's home movies, which have never been broadcast before. He captures camp life, time-killing rituals like chess and horseshoes. It's how many of them relax before a mission. And a big one is coming. The 345th aims for Kaviang, a key link in the Japanese supply chain that runs all the way out to Rabaul. Americans will aim squarely for the supply dumps in a risky, low-level attack. There were once plans to invade Kaviang, but MacArthur is saving his ground forces for an eventual invasion of the Philippines. The Allies will try to neutralize it with air power alone. Captain Hanna films the action himself.
Bullets fly from nose guns with telltale sparks. Bursts of anti-aircraft fire litter the sky above the harbor. They aim for Japanese planes, fuel, and cargo ships. Flying in formation through the smoke is chaotic. One plane almost drops its bombs on another one below it. On the way out, they spot a listing Japanese freighter and try to finish it off. In this daring raid, Americans cripple a linchpin of the Japanese supply chain. These low-lying raids succeed in putting a stranglehold on Rabaul. The Japanese supply chain is eventually severed, and 100,000 Japanese troops on Rabaul are stuck, left to wither on the vine. General MacArthur is finally moving closer to his target, the Philippines. He continues his advance along the coast of New Guinea. Meanwhile, the island hopping campaign continues in the Central Pacific. After his victory at Kwajalein, Nimitz eyes the harbor and airstrip on the atoll of Anuitok. But it's protected by Truk, one of Japan's strongest remaining bases in the Pacific. With four airstrips and 400 planes, Truk could make the Anuitok invasion a nightmare. Two days before landing on Anuitok, 300 fighter planes launch off the Essex carriers. Tracers fly. They take dead aim on Truk's airfields. 30 separate strikes deliver unrelenting pressure. Each one is more powerful than the Japanese strike at Pearl Harbor. Americans take out 250 planes and 40 naval ships. Truk is silenced. Never again will Japan use it as a major operating base. The skies are cleared for an assault on Anuitok. More than 10,000 men approach the target. For two days, American ships blast the island while the invasion force waits and hopes the enemy is buckling. On the beach, resistance is light. There are only a few thousand defenders on the island, but it won't be a picnic. Japan also took lessons from Tarawa. Here they built pillboxes just as strong, but now they're connected underground. Troops caught in these spiderweb networks are shot at from all sides as the Japanese rapidly shift from one foxhole to another. Progress is slow. It takes four days for the Americans to clean up Anuitok. Two hundred and sixty two soldiers lay dead, while Japan loses more than two thousand. It's another victory for Nimitz. The Marshall Islands are finally in Allied hands. The Japanese are stung but not stagnant. They will respond.
With the capture of the Marshals 10 weeks ahead of schedule, Americans ratchet up their entire effort in the Pacific. They build more naval bases, more fortifications, and more airfields. They make bold plans to move more quickly. Americans proved that a frontal invasion from the water onto a fortified beachhead is possible. Amphibious assaults are now coming of age. Island hopping will soon become synonymous with the Pacific War. But the next step is far bigger, a lot farther, and will be a test unlike any other.